and let me welcome you here to Brevary Church and to those watching and listening too, we, we welcome you in the name of Jesus, our King and Saviour. Um, well done in braving it through the, the wind and the, the rain this morning, particularly those who've got to make a bit of a walk, um, well done. Um, I was saying to folk at Abuthnet that the other day when it, the weather was like this, our four-year-old um, asked in the middle of the afternoon, because we had the light, lights on all day, said, why is it still night time? Uh, and it feels very much um, like that again today, but I must say well done for coming here and it's great to gather as God's people to worship him. Uh, By way of notices this morning, a few things. First up, a reminder about the Blythewood shoebox appeal. If you've not got a leaflet yet, um, shoebox has got to be brought back at the very, very latest in two Sundays time on the 3rd of November. Um, But preferably if you could bring it back even next week or whatever you want to put in the shoebox, even if you don't have a shoebox itself, um, to bring it back next week, it means it can be kind of packaged and sorted through before we ship them off um, on the 4th of November. But if not, then certainly by the 3rd of November. Also, we have uh, magazines from the Scottish Bible Society. Um, and the way out, you can take one home if you'd like. It's uh, a real encouragement to hear what um, they do. We had a speaker from them back in June. And yes, yeah, encouragement to take them home and uh, see what God's doing um, in Scotland and around the world um, through Bible societies. It's not, it doesn't mention it in here, but just a week or so ago, uh, there were stats out that tell us that now um, over half of the world's languages have um, a Bible, or at least part of the Bible, in their native tongue. You might say, well, that doesn't sound like very many. There are over 7,000 languages in the world, most of which have only a few hundred or a few thousand speakers at most. So it would be like the Isle of Lewis having its own language, you could have Gaelic, but having your own language that no one else in the world speaks, and someone's got to find a way to translate the Bible into their language. So, and something like 98% of the world um, has a full Bible or has part of the Bible in their native tongue. So they can hear God saying to them, I love you, um, you're my child in their native language. And we praise God for that. One last thing, it's just up on the screen there, that in a couple of weeks' time, on the 2nd of November, we've got our second Who Let the Dads Out group for um, dads and granddads and male carers and their young children, kind of preschool or early primary school um, it's an encouragement that if you're a granddad and you've got young grandchildren, you can bring them along, or if you know other dads in the community, feel free to send them along. Um, last time we were there, um, the hall was packed and we had a great time with bacon rolls and toys and games, um, and lots of folk from all over came along too. So please do be praying for that, and if you know anyone that would fit the bill, send them along to on the 2nd of November, uh, next door to church centre in the morning. We come to worship our God and our King and we'll stand and sing uh, for Abel. We'll sing together, come people of the risen King.
Gracious and loving God, we still our hearts and we still our minds before you. We acknowledge that you are the fount of every blessing, that you alone are the God of glory, that you are the source of life and all that is good. And this morning we bless you for the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our hearts praise you not only because he's a direct representation of his Father, but he's a greatest expression of the Father's love for us. Thank you that he proves the point that no one has greater love than this than to lay down their life for their friends. Thank you that God commends his love to us in this, that while we were yet sinful, Christ died for us. So our hearts rejoice this morning that through Jesus, the gateway to life with you is opened wide. We marvel that while we were lost in the pit of dirt and grime, caught up in our sinfulness and rebellion, Jesus Christ came to us rich and flowing with grace, coming down to rescue us. So we thank you, God, for flinging wide those heavenly gates, for being the light to our path and the lamp to our feet. Thank you for sending the good news of Jesus across the lands and the seas, that it would someday impact the person who told us of the beauty and love of Christ. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit upon our hearts, that you've taken them from being hard to being ready to receive the good news of Jesus. Thank you for adopting us, rescuing us, making us into sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, I ask this morning that wherever we are in the journey of life and in that journey of faith, that you will come by your Holy Spirit to impact our hearts and lives in you, taking off the ragged and the rough edges shaping us and molding us into the likeness of Jesus. And may we all experience and have an experience of your power and your goodness working within our souls. May we be like Moses as he meets with you on the mountainside, or Isaiah as he falls down on his face in the temple, or the disciples as they spend their lives alongside the Son of God. Lord, take our weary souls And may they long and thirst for you, more of you. May our hearts that are restless, may they become found uh, found full of rest in you. May you become our great treasure, the satisfaction of our souls. And in the journey of our worship today, as we sing your praise and read and proclaim your word, may your Holy Spirit be among us and moving powerfully within us, that no longer will we be content or settled where we are with you, but we would long to know you more, long to discover all of your life, your hope, and the newness that you offer on each of us today. Lord God, meet with us where we are in our needs, we pray. For we bring you all of our prayers in Jesus' name, and in his words we gather up our prayers, the words that appear on the screens. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing again, and this time we're going to um, pause and lead us in the organ, and we're going to sing together. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Again, for Abel, we'll stand and sing.
for his organ this morning is going to read for us from Philippians chapter 1. We've been reading, um, or started last week, looking through the letter to the Philippians, Paul's letter, and so we read from verse 12, page 1178. Philippians chapter 1, from verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, And I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this 
will mean fruitful labor to me. But what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. As I said last week, we began to look through Philippians. We'll be looking at it up until Advent. And many of you, maybe when you just came in this morning, um, Margaret very kindly printed off um, a still from the end of the video that we watched last week that has an overview of Philippians. And we'll be largely kind of following the kind of same pattern that we see in that. So if, if it's helpful to you to, to look at that or to take it home and um, think about it as you read through Philippians, perhaps at home, then feel free to do so. But the situation we find ourselves in as we get to the second half of chapter 1 of Philippians, we find Paul in a terrible trial. Paul is in prison in some way, shape or form, whether in a physical jail or he's in house arrest. And as part of that punishment, he'd be chained to at least one Roman guard at all times. One, maybe two, and perhaps the others around him um, watching guard too. He's stuck. He's not able to have any privacy. He goes to the bathroom. If he wants to get changed, whatever else, folk are there watching over his shoulders. If his friends come and speak to him, someone in the Roman guard is there by his side, listening into every conversation. Not only is Paul in a very demeaning and demoralizing situation, but his whole kind of way of life has now been overthrown and upturned. He's a church planter. He's going to new places like Philippi eh, many years before and planting new churches, bringing folk to know Jesus and starting little congregations. But he can't do that. He's stuck in prison. And more than that, as we um, look at history, the, the history tells us that Paul, within a year or two of this letter being written, will be killed for his faith. And he knows that he's going to soon die. He, he's very conscious of the fact that he's probably not got long left in this world. And yet we'll discover, and amongst all of those things, despite the kind of hardship from society, the hardship from the fact he's going to die, he still says amongst all of those things, whether I live or die, it does not matter to me. It's a small thing. He's triumphing in there. He's not discouraged. He's not in despair. And here's why. He has a proper definition for life. A definition for life that allows him to triumph over whatever the world can throw at him. Even imprisonment, the fact he's far away from family and friends, or even death itself. Here in the second half of Philippians chapter 1, Paul is teaching us and the people of Philippi and the church there, it's not the circumstances of your life that's important, it's your definition for life. So whether things go well for you or bad for you in life, it's not that that defines whether you stand or fall. It's how you define life that will cause you to stand or fall. And when I say definition for life, what I'm asking you is, what do you live for? What's the most important thing for you? 
What is the thing that makes your life worth living regardless of whatever else happens to you? Paul writes to them, striving to encourage them, saying, I'm not discouraged. Even though I might die soon for this faith in Jesus that I have, I might live 20 more years into my 80s, or I might die tomorrow, it does not matter to me. Because what is happening to me is not harming my life. That which I live for isn't touched by what the world does to me. And so if Paul can triumph through life, and he can show us how he triumphs through life, then I hope we too, as we take on board what Paul says, that we might triumph through life in the good times and in the sorrowful times. I know amongst us this morning there are folk who are grieving, folk who are struggling with illness or the illness of family and friends, those who are worried for the future, whether retirement or whatever else might be approaching soon. We too can triumph in the highs and the lows of life. But before we get there, I want to um, think about something else quickly. Paul begins what we read today as he says in verse 12, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul is writing here and he's addressing to the concerns of the Philippians. Here's the guy who founded their church, the guy who inspires them, who encourages them. Wherever Paul goes around the world at that point, churches begin to flourish. And so they're scared, discouraged, disheartened. It looks like their founder founder is going to be snuffed out. His life will be ended. Think of all the things that Paul could still do if he lived for another 20 years. Oh, no, he's stuck in prison. Our friend, the one who helped us to know Jesus. It's so rubbish that he's stuck in prison. Paul goes on to say in verses 15 onwards, It's true that some people preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do it in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel, but the former, those who preach out of rivalry and so on, do so um, out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. So Paul's stuck in prison, and there's other folk that perhaps he talked about Jesus, and now all these years later on, they're a bit annoyed that Paul gets all the limelight. Folks say, Oh, did you hear Paul's great message about Jesus? Or did you know that Paul was the one who actually told me about Jesus? Yeah, it wasn't that guy. It was Paul that told me about Jesus. And now Paul's away from the scene. And they're like, I can take his place. I'm going to start getting all the limelight. I'm going to get the glory for telling others about Jesus. Paul says, that's happening out there. They're wanting all the attention. They want the pats on the back. They want the round of applause at church. He's been taunted and maligned. He's been shunned. But on top of this, as I said earlier, he faces a death sentence. His death is approaching. But in amidst all of those things, at least, he says, I want you to know that what's happened to me, being stuck in prison, facing death, being persecuted by others, has been a good thing. It's actually caused to serve and advance the gospel. How could that be? Paul's job is to go out into the world out there, tell more people about Jesus, and yet he's stuck inside. But he says, that's a great thing. Why? Because Paul could recognize that God had a plan for him wherever he was. But he says in verse 13, as a result of me being stuck in prison, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard, through all the soldiers, and to everyone else, that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord other Christians have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fiercely. As I said, Paul every day, 24 hours a day, is stuck to someone else and they've got no option but to hear about Jesus. Every day, Paul would have a captive audience of at least a handful of folk as they rotated through their shifts. If he was there for a few months, it could be hundreds of different Roman guards and their families who are impacted because they had no option but to hear of this person called Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus was the savior of Paul and could be the savior of them, that he knew Jesus as a light of the world and a hope for himself, and they too could have that hope and that light. And his decision to use that situation he found himself in to tell others of Jesus was inspiring other Christians too. A few weeks ago, we had open doors come to speak, of, speak to us about how persecuted Christians are living out their faith. And for me, that was inspiring, and I'm sure for many of us, it was inspiring. 
that we get to come to church quite easily today, but for many folk, it could be life or death. And yet they choose to do so. And so if you leave Paul and his friends alone, they plant new churches to turn the world upside down. But if you put him in prison, he turns it into a new church family. It's the same for you and for me. God has a plan for you, almost certainly exactly where you are. Now you might find or feel, if God gave me more money or gave me more of this or did this in my life, I could be used better by God. So if I got an inheritance of a million pounds, I could give it all to the church or to a Bible translator or someone else to do great things for the kingdom. Or if I just had better health, then I could be used in this kind of way. Now that might be true, but it's not always true. Maybe it's not that you need a change of scenery or circumstance, but a change of mindset. Do you see the situation that you find yourself in now with your family, your workplace, the community groups that you attend throughout the week? Do you see all of that with the eyes that God has for it? Because God looks upon the people you spend the most time with, with love and compassion. There are sheep without a shepherd and God says, I want someone to bring the goodness of Jesus in that place. So maybe tomorrow you wake up and you dread going to work. And okay, I hope that that changes for you. And maybe you're like, oh, I wish I could be somewhere else doing something else. But maybe God wants you exactly in that workplace to bring the light of Jesus into an office or factory floor where no one else knows Jesus. Maybe almost certainly your colleagues are like the Roman guard in this account stuck with this person, i.e. you, that person who knows and who loves Jesus day after day. They're not able to escape the fact that there's someone who knows the light and the love of Jesus amongst them. They can't escape the fact that this person has been transformed by the good news of Jesus. Or the same applies to you living in your home or the community you find yourself in, whether that's your physical neighbours or the bingo group you go to or anything else that you're part of. You might think that you moved here because work for yourself or a spouse brought you here. You might think, and it's a case for a couple of folk in our church this morning, that you moved here because it's a nice home to retire into. Maybe some of you are here because it's where your family um, raised you and you grew up here. Wrong. You're not here because of work or retirement or because your parents lived here and you grew up here. You're here because God wants you here. He wants you to bring the kingdom of heaven to your neighbours and your community as you go with the goodness of Jesus in your heart and in your soul to pour it out bit by bit as you go to work and you hang out with your friends and you intermingle with those in the shop and in the community. Paul thought, I've got to be out there until he saw everything with God's eyes. The mission field was not always out there. It could be right where he was. The soldiers and the others in the Roman government needed to hear about Jesus too. Yes, he could do stuff out there, but he could also do stuff right where he was too. And that's not the fact that Paul's making the best of a bad situation. He's seeing things through God's eyes. He'd come to have a new definition for life that allowed him to have hope, whatever the circumstance, joy amidst the pain, life when death encroached. And here it comes to the crux of this definition for life. From the second half of chapter 18 of that new paragraph, He says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There he's telling us how we can live and come up against all the bad things. In verse 21, for to me, to live is all about Jesus Christ. And to die, that's a gain. That's a good thing. If you have a proper definition for life, you'll be able to face anything. If you don't have a good definition for life, when bad things happen, you'll crumble. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's my definition for life, says Paul. For to me, to live is all about Jesus Christ. That's what makes life life for me, says Paul. 
That's my bottom line, my foundation. If I have Jesus, I'm living. Take away everything else and I can still live because I have Jesus. For some, the goal in life is pleasure. I want new experiences. I want more money to buy new things, to enjoy life all the more. A new phone, a new car, a new holiday, whatever it might be. But take away their money, take away the comfort, take away the pleasures. There is no life. For others, it might be about being tough, strong, in control. But when weakness comes through infirmity or old age or whatever else happens, life is over for them. Tragedies and troubles come to us all that makes life so much harder. And they take away that which often makes life worth living. But unless you make or change your definition for life, you'll collapse. Now, for many of us, what makes life worth living is the more normal things of life. Our family, our friends, our career, our spouse, our children. And we say, for me to live is to have my spouse, my children, my family, my career, whatever it might be. But when the tragedies of life come, and it goes after our bottom lines, our foundations to life, will collapse. So Paul says, there is only one definition for life, one foundational aspect to life, only one important thing that will stand up to anything. For to me, to live is Christ. Paul's career is kaput. He's a church planter. He can't plant churches anymore. But his career is not his life, and so therefore he can still live. So what he says, I might live, I might die, my career might go. But it hasn't touched my real life. If you lose your career and your whole life begins to collapse, the problem is not that you lost your career. It's your definition of your life. We've got a couple of retired ministers amongst us this morning, and maybe they can tell you if it's a case of colleagues of theirs, but I know of ministers where the second they retire, the whole life collapses because they love being up the front. They love all the fact that they get to do all that stuff, and the day they retire, they're like, my life is over. What's life all about now? I've made my whole life all about the fact that I get to be the minister, and now no one calls me minister anymore. I don't have all the stuff that I do. I get to be a punter in the pew, like all of you. What's life all about now? Or here's Paul. He, he loves the church in Philippi. He loves his friends. He talks about his love for them. But though he can't see them, and though he can't see them, he's devastated. But his friends are not his life. There's lots of people who will live for their children, or their spouse, their family, or for their friends. And that's more noble than living for a job. But what are you going to do when they die? Or a divorce happens, or you can't see them? If your life collapses when those you love collapse, it means that your loves were your life. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't grieve and be struggling when they die or they um, part from you. But the underlying problem is not the fact that they died or left. It's your definition for life. Because all of these things will come to us. Many of us will retire. Many of us, unfortunately, will go through bereavement. Many of us might be separated from things that we love. What are we going to do then? Paul sees a hardness of life, but it doesn't face him. He has a proper definition of life. He was in love with Jesus Christ, his whole being, who his whole life was dominated by the love that God has for him and that he has back for God. Everything about him was controlled by Jesus, and therefore he could live through life. His great goal, his passion, his everything was that Jesus would be seen as supremely great in every aspect of his life, that he would glorify God in life. For to me, to live, it's all about Jesus. Or later, we'll look at chapter 3 in a few weeks' time, and there Paul writes these famous words. He says, whatever, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. So Paul basically gets a set of scales, and he takes all the good things of life, he takes all the pleasures, all the joys, all the things that fill him with happiness, his family, his friends, his career, everything. He puts them on one side of the scales. And obviously, they plummet to the ground. Then he gets Jesus, just Jesus, and knowing him, and putting them on the other side of the scales. And the scales thunder to the ground on Jesus' side. 
Because Jesus is infinitely more precious, more valuable, more satisfying to him than everything else that life could ever give to him. It swells his heart, this joy of knowing Jesus, with an inexpressible joy. Think of how Jesus describes conversion, about knowing Jesus in your life. He has this wonderful parable in chapter 13 of Matthew's Gospel, just a couple of lines long. He says, The kingdom of heaven, knowing Jesus, is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man finds the treasure and he covers it up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that very same field. Did you hear that phrase? In his joy. So the man in the parable finds or comes across a field that, and he spots something. That's a treasure chest. That's some diamonds. That's some jewels buried over there. And he goes, I want that field. So he goes and gets some mud and he covers up the treasure so that no one else can see it. Then he runs into town. He wants that field. He wants that treasure. And he runs into the the town um, because he wants this treasure that Jesus says is basically discovering salvation or knowing Jesus as your king. He runs into the town, into the streets with joy. And he shouts, Take my car, take my computer, give you my house, take my wedding ring, take my everything. Take it all. Because I will be able to buy it back with the treasure that I will have a hundredfold over. That's Paul's conviction. You can throw me in jail. What's the matter? You can try and outdo me and be more popular than me. So what? I have Jesus. I have everything I will ever need. Paul writes these wonderful words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to read it, but it's a wonderful, big, long paragraph or two of Paul describing everything that's happened to him, all the junk that's happened to him. He talks about how he's been persecuted and hard, he's faced hardship so much. He speaks of numerous beatings, shipwrecks, imprisonment, danger from those out to kill him, whether in the towns or cities or out in the countryside. He's been sleepless, went through hunger and thirst and all the more. And the amazing thing is that Paul writes these words in Philippians after going through all of those things. He says, I can be shipwrecked, beaten so many times to the point of almost death. I can go hungry and thirsty. I can be in threat for my life everywhere I go. So what? I have Jesus. For he's more satisfying to me than a life of comfort and peace. Enjoying the love of Jesus is more precious to me than fame or fortune. More wonderful to me than having a steady income or a nice cottage by the sea to retire to. That's what he says when he says, to me to live is Christ. Christ is more magnified in Paul's life when Paul says, doesn't matter what you give to me, Jesus is better than that. And when we're living in Christ, when we become part of the family of Jesus, there rises up a courage within our souls that's unstoppable. Throw us in prison, so what? Persecution can't stop it. Trials can't stop it. And the ultimate trial itself, death, cannot stop it. For Paul goes on to say, back in verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that in no way I'll be ashamed, but I'll have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die it's gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, that will mean fruitful labor for me. I can tell more people about Jesus. But what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. He says, in life and death. Jesus can be magnified. Jesus can be shown as supremely great. For because my life is all about Jesus, and if I die, I get to be with Jesus, he says. And that is better by far, he tells us. Death is a gain, a wonderful thing for Paul. And for those of us who trust Jesus, that's the same for all of us, true. It means that we are greater, more greatly close to Jesus for all of eternity. Death is to depart and be with Christ. That's why Paul can say in verse 21, not only is life all about Jesus, but death can be all about Jesus too. You can add up all the things I will lose when I die. I will lose my family, 
my job, my dream retirement, my round the world cruise. I will leave behind my friends, my favourite food, sexual pleasure and all the rest of life. And if you add up all of those things and all the millions of other things I will lose and you replace them only with death, I know in Jesus forever, I want Jesus forever. His Jesus glorifying ministry will be extinguished. But in his death, people will see. Paul's not fussed. Life on earth will be replaced with the unshielded presence of Jesus himself. You can't kill Christians like that. Well, you can, but they don't care. Because knowing Jesus is far better. They get to be with him. So what if you kill me? I get to be with Jesus forever. Now, I don't want you to go home from today going, well, I want to sell everything I have and I want to live as a kind of, yeah, live in a cave for the rest of my life because I'm not allowed to enjoy things. That's not what I'm saying. You can enjoy things. You should enjoy things that life gives to you. Enjoy the, the giggles of children and grandchildren. Kirsten and I went to the theatre the other day. I enjoyed going on a date night with my wife and going to the theatre. You can enjoy good things of life. But it also means when you realise this, what Paul says, you know another life is coming. Another world that's better than this one, even at its best, is coming. And not better by a little bit, but better by far. My desire to, is to depart and be with Jesus Christ, for that is far better. Because I get to see face to face the wonder of my Saviour. I get to experience him with all of my senses, not just in my mind or my heart, but I get to embrace Jesus, see Jesus, speak to Jesus face to face. All my longings, my desires will be taken away. I'll be satisfied in Jesus. He is my gain. The good news of Jesus is not about people going to heaven. It's about people getting to God. Because heaven is good only because God is there. That's what makes heaven heavenly. It's not about the fact that you won't be sick or that you won't be tired or you won't have to do a boring job forever. It's the fact that God's there. That's what makes heaven heavenly. And once you've been there for millennia upon millennia, God will still be the best thing about heaven. So Jesus is not only the way to heaven, he is what makes heaven worth wanting. He is a great banquet feast, the ocean of delights, the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl of great price. And if that's true, if we really think that way, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, how awesome will it look when you die? Many of us will die one day in a hospital or hospice bed. And around us will be many other folk in that same situation. And they'll be scrambling with their last few days and last few breaths going, I want to tick one or two more things off my bucket list. I'm worried. I'm anxious. I'm scared. But you're going to look really strange there in that hospital bed. Because you can have a deep and abiding peace. You can talk to others about how much life is about to get so much better for you. You can smile even through the horrible pain as you go through the medication, you take it on board or you go through the operations. You can be strange and beautiful people who sing with your final breaths. And if you die like that, what will that say about Jesus? I've had the privilege of spending some time with folk who are in their last few days. Never been somebody in their last breath, but been close to the end. I've watched a few saints die well. And in those moments, Jesus looks far more valuable than anything life could have ever given to them or that death could ever take from them. I want to die like that. Now, in many ways, I hope that I don't die for a long time. I want to watch my kids grow up. I want to be married for a long time. But if I had to die tonight or tomorrow or in many decades to come, I want to die like that. That God would be supremely glorified in my life and I hope in yours when you know that the day you die will be the greatest day you've ever lived. You might live for a hundred years here on this earth and go through amazing things, but the day you die, that will be the best day you've ever lived. So in life and in death, and in joys and in sorrows, may Jesus be your greatest treasure, your soul's satisfaction. May he be the definition of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words which you inspired Paul to write all of these years ago. 
Thank you for the, the truth that he tells us here of how Jesus is the greatest treasure, the most wonderful thing that we could ever have in life. And Father, I pray for any of us here this morning who treasure something more than Jesus, who are putting their hope in money or in comfort or good health or something else. But Father, bit by bit, we'll be able to let go and realize Jesus is the only one who can see us through this life and into the next. Father, help us all to find our greatest joy, our greatest treasure in Jesus, so that when we die, we would know that death is gain. Lord, bless us with this faith we ask. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing about that very thing, about turning our eyes upon Jesus. Let's stand and sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Good morning. Just in case any of you are likely to get distracted by trying to think where one or two of the words came from in this prayer, it's from Psalm 46. Let us pray. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord God, we praise you today, thinking of you as our everlasting refuge and strength. We ask for your spirit and strength to be with us as we pray for some of the big things that have come to our attention this week, many of which seem like impossible situations to us, but not to you. We bring you, first of all, our thanks for the week that's gone by and all you've given us, for families, homes, warmth, rewarding work, food, sunshine, rain, and the beauty of autumn, good books, time with friends, and so much more. If we were to list all you've given us, even in the quietest of weeks, it would take a long, long time. For some of us, though, the joy is shrouded right now and difficult to find through grief and suffering. Here in our local church family, we ask for your presence and peace for all who are grieving loss. Loss of a loved one, of a relationship, of energy, of mobility, the loss of a valued job or position. We know that all things work together for good to those who love you, but it can be hard to remember and hold on to this. For those for whom the joy of life is clouded over today, may you fill them with your peace and give them strength and patience to endure and to wait. Let us be still and know that you are God. Some of us are spoiling the joy of the day through fear and anxiety about illnesses affecting ourselves or others, about our finances, our work, family issues, relationship issues, things that have happened in our past, things we project into an imagined future, our own mortality. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of faith. Although we know all is in your hands, we spend too much time worrying. We remember Paul, for whom to live or die was esteemed about equal, depending on how he could best serve you. We remember Jesus, gently chiding Martha for being concerned and worried about many things, when only one is needed to look to him. Jesus, our one and only. We lay all of this at your feet. May we learn to rejoice in every circumstance, knowing you are there with us in, in control. Let us not fear, for the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We ask for unity, wisdom, and love, and especially love, to prevail in the wider church. Everywhere you are worshipped, whatever the denomination. We thank you that in many places your church grows, you're exalted among the nations. You're exalted in the earth. We ask for forgiveness. Your church has not always represented you faithfully and well, and sometimes makes the newspaper headlines for all the wrong reasons. It's a fact that for many, organized religion is not to be trusted, and for others, the joy you mean us to feel as part of your family has gone. Show us where our own attitudes and behaviours do not help your church to faithfully exalt your name, whether through lack of unity or wisdom or love. Build your church here among us, Lord, that all may come in. Father, looking at our world in the assurance of your strength and power, and as an ever-present help in trouble, we lift up the plight of so many people who have been forced to leave their homes through conflict or persecution. We remember those who've lived for a long time in permanent refugee camps and those who've traveled long distances to reach safety, often having experienced great trauma and loss. We pray to you, Lord, who are close to the brokenhearted and who saves those who are crushed in spirit. Reach each one of them with your care. Meet their needs, allay their fears, we pray for peace and reconciliation to prevail in their homelands, for the work of peacemakers, charities, and local churches, that it will yield fruit. 
you make war cease to the ends of the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Thanks so much, Sandra. We close our time together as we sing one more time. We sing before the throne of God above. filled with the treasure that is Jesus. And may God's blessing be with you from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, today and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Uh, I don't think there's anyone tea and coffee rota this morning, but because the kids are off, because uh, of the uh, holidays no kingdom kids, then I, I'm happy to go through and boil the kettle if folk want to join me next door. But uh, if not, then God bless, and we'll see you next week.